we would never have cash around just to have cash. I mean, we would never think that we should have a cash position uh, of X percent. And I, frankly, I think these asset allocation things that that uh, the tacticians in Wall Street put out, you know, about 60 percent stocks and 30 percent. We, we think that's total nonsense. Warren Buffett, der wohl erfolgreichste Investor unserer Zeit, spricht in mehreren Interviews darüber, an welche elf Mythen Privatanleger glauben und welchen Unsinn die Finanzindustrie den Anlegern weismachen will. Im heutigen Video gibt es elf Fehler, die Privatanleger beim Investieren machen, also viel Spaß beim Video. You may have trouble believing this, but I, I, uh, Charlie and I never have an opinion about the market because Uh, it wouldn't be any good and it might interfere with the opinions we have that are good. It, uh, uh, the, if, we, if we're right about a business, if we think a business is attractive, it would be very foolish for us to not take action on that because we thought something about what the market was going to do or, or, or anything of that sort. Because we just don't know and, and, and to give up something that you do know and that is profitable for something that you don't know and won't know because of that it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to us and it doesn't really make any difference to us ja warren buffett lässt sich von der aktuellen marktlage nicht aus der ruhe bringen er lässt sich also nicht diktieren wann er aktien kauft oder verkauft das heißt selbst wenn wir im breiten markt eine überbewertung haben kann es doch sein dass einzelne aktien trotzdem attraktiv sind auch andere große Investoren wie Peter Lynch haben ähnliche Gedanken zum Markt. Sie wissen einfach nicht, wann der nächste Crash kommt und deswegen versuchen sie es gar nicht, ihre Zeit und Energie mit Marktprognosen zu verschwenden. Und Buffett sagt hier etwas sehr, sehr Spannendes. Er ist nicht bereit, das aufzugeben, was er weiß. Also wenn er ein Unternehmen analysiert hat, wie profitabel das Unternehmen ist und das Ganze aufzugeben für etwas, was er nicht weiß, was irgendwo in der Zukunft liegt, da ist er nicht bereit dazu. There's nothing magic. We like to put a lot of money in things that uh, that we feel strongly about. And that gets back to the diversification question. Uh, we think diversification is as practice generally makes very little sense for anyone that knows what they're doing. Uh, they diversification is a protection against ignorance. I mean, if you want to make sure that nothing bad happens to you relative to the market, you own everything. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that is a perfectly sound approach for somebody who, who does not feel they know how to analyze businesses. If you know how to analyze businesses and value businesses, it's crazy to own 50 stocks or 40 stocks or 30 stocks probably, uh, because there aren't that many wonderful businesses at, that are understandable to a single human being in all likelihood. And it, And to have some super wonderful business and then put money in number 30 or 35 on your list of attractiveness and, and forego putting more money into number one just strikes Charlie and me as, as, as madness. And it, it, it's conventional practice and it, it, it may, uh, you know, if all you have to achieve is, is average, uh, it it's, uh, it, it's, uh, may preserve your job. But it, it's a confession in our view that you don't really understand the businesses that you own. Um, you know, I base, I mean, as on a personal portfolio basis, you know, I own one stock, you know, it, but it's a business I know, it, and, and it leaves me very comfortable. Uh, so, you know, do I, do I need to own 28 stocks in order to, you know, have proper diversification, you know, and, uh, be nonsense. And within Berkshire, I could pick out three of our businesses, and I would, I would be very happy if they were the only businesses we owned and I had all my money in Berkshire. Now, I love it, the fact that we can find more than that and that we keep adding to it. But three wonderful businesses, it's more than you need in this life to do very well. And uh, uh, the, average, the average person isn't going to run into that. I mean, if you look at how the fortunes were built in this country, they weren't built out of a portfolio of 50 companies. They were, they were built by someone who, who uh, identified with us with a wonderful business. Coca-Cola is a great example. A lot of fortunes have been built on that. And there aren't 50 Coca-Colas. You know, there aren't 20. If there were, it'd be fine. We could all go out and diversify like crazy among that group and, and get results that would be equal to owning the really wonderful one. But you're not going to find it. And, uh, and the truth is you don't need it. I mean, if you, if you have a really wonderful business is very well protected against against the vicissitudes of the economy over time and, and, and the competition. I mean, 
You know, we're talking about businesses that are resistant to effective competition. And three of those will be better than 100 average businesses. At, uh, uh, and, and they'll be safer, incidentally. I mean, uh, they, there is less risk in owning three easy to identify wonderful businesses there, than there is in owning 50 uh, well-known big businesses. It's amazing what has been taught over the years in finance classes about that. But uh, if I had to bet the next 30 years on the fortunes of, uh, of my family that would be dependent upon the income from a given group of businesses, I would rather pick three businesses from those we own than own a diversified group of 50. Charlie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what he's saying is that much of what is taught in modern corporate finance courses is twaddle. Ja, Diversification is a protection against ignorance. Wer sich breit diversifiziert, der schützt sich vor Unwissenheit. Und hier möchte ich einwerfen, dass für viele Privatanleger, ich sage jetzt mal 80 bis 90 Prozent, genau diese Diversifikation der richtige Weg ist. Denn wenn Aktien nicht deine Leidenschaft sind und du keinen Spaß daran hast, dich in Geschäftsmodelle reinzufuchsen, dann macht es durchaus Sinn, den breiten Index zu kaufen. Damit hast du dann langfristig deine 5 bis 7 Prozent Rendite pro Jahr und somit ein Standbein für die Altersvorsorge. Wer aber wirklich leidenschaftlich in Aktien investiert, und die Risiken kennt, für den kann ein Ansatz mit 5 bis 10 Aktien der richtige sein. Denn je weniger Aktien ich kaufe, desto mehr muss ich mir vor meinen Investments Gedanken über eben diese Aktien machen. Denn ein Totalverlust einer Aktie hat bei 5 Aktien im Portfolio viel größere Auswirkungen als bei 50 Aktien. Das heißt, weniger Aktien machen mich auf eine gewisse Art und Weise wählerisch und ich überlege ganz genau, ob ich jetzt zuschlage oder eben nicht. Und ich habe natürlich einen viel besseren Überblick. Wenn ich als Schäfer nur fünf Schafe habe, ist es leichter, alle zu überblicken, wie wenn ich tausend Schafe habe. Das Volatility does not measure risk. The problem is that the people who have written and taught about risk do not know how to measure risk. And the nice thing about beta, which is a measure of volatility, is that it's nice and mathematical and wrong and in terms of measuring risk. It's a, it is a, good, it's a measure of volatility, but past volatility does not determine the risk of investing. I mean, actually take it with farmland here in 1980 or in the early 1980s, farms that sold for $2,000 an acre went to $600 an acre. I bought one of them. Uh, when the banking and farm crash took place and the beta of farms shot way up. And according to standard economic theory, market theory, I was buying a much more risky asset at $600 an acre than the same farm was at $2,000 an acre. Now people, because farmland doesn't trade often and prices don't get recorded, you know, they would regard that as nonsense, that, that my purchase at $600 an acre of the same farm that sold for $2,000 an acre a few years ago was riskier. But in stocks, because the prices jiggle around every minute, and because it lets the people who teach finance use the mathematics they've learned, they would explain this away a little more technically, but they have, in effect, translated volatility into all kinds of uh, past volatility in terms of all kinds of measures of risk. And uh, it, it's nonsense. Risk comes from the nature of certain kinds of businesses, It can be risky to be in some businesses just by the simple economics of the type of business you're in. Uh, and, and it comes from not knowing what you're doing. It is, if you understand the economics of the business in which you are and, uh, engaged and you, and you know the people with whom you're doing business and you know the price you pay and uh, is sensible, you don't run any real risk. And I don't think Charlie and I, and we've done a lot of things in things in securities that had a very high beta. We've done a, thing, a lot of things in securities that had a low beta. It just, the whole development of, the, of volatility as a measure of risk, it's really occurred in my, and it, it's been very useful for people who wanted a career in teaching, but it is not, we've never found a way for it to be useful to us. Charlie? Well, it's been amazing that, that both corporate finance and investment management courses as taught in the major universities, we would argue it's at least 50% twaddle. 
yet these people have very high IQs. One of the reasons we've been able to do pretty well is that we early recognized that very smart people do very dumb things, and we tried to figure out why. And we also wanted to know who, so we could avoid them. Die Volatilität, also die Schwankungsbreite einer Aktie, misst nicht ihr tatsächliches Risiko. Aber genau das ist es, was von der Finanzindustrie suggeriert wird. Es wird gesagt, je höher die Schwankungen sind, desto höher das Risiko für den Anleger. Und leider ist auch das Temperament vieler Anleger genau darauf getrimmt. Nämlich große Schwankungen sind schlecht und Anleger werden dann nervös und verkaufen ihre Aktien. Wenn ich aber als Anleger die Unternehmen, in die ich investiert habe, genau verstehe, dann kann mir die Schwankung egal sein, solange ich weiß, dass das grundlegende Geschäftsmodell des Unternehmens weiterhin intakt ist. Wenn ich dagegen eine Aktie habe, die fünf Jahre lang kaum Schwankungen hatte, im sechsten Jahr aber pleite geht, dann hat mir das ganze geringe Schwankungsrisiko absolut null gebracht. It's a temperamental quality, not an intellectual quality. You, you don't need tons of IQ in this business. I mean, you have to have enough IQ to get from here to downtown Omaha, but, uh, but uh, You do not have to be able to play three-dimensional chess or be in the top leagues in terms of bridge playing or something of the sort. You need a stable personality. You need a temperament that neither derives great pleasure from being with the crowd or against the crowd. Because this is not a business where you take polls. It's a business where you think. And Ben Graham would say that you're not right or wrong because a thousand people agree with you. Ja, zum Investieren braucht man weniger den IQ als das richtige Temperament. Selbst Isaac Newton, dessen IQ auf 190 geschätzt wurde, hat damals während der großen Südseeblase versagt und fast sein komplettes Vermögen verspielt. Wer also hochintelligent ist, sich aber von steigenden Aktienkursen mitreißen lässt oder bei fallenden Kursen in Panik verfällt, der wird beim Investieren höchstwahrscheinlich nicht erfolgreich sein. Genau das Thema IQ beim Investieren habe ich schon in einem meiner früheren Videos genau behandelt. Den Link dazu findest du oben in der Infokarte. By far the best investment you can make is in yourself. I mean, uh, for example, communication skills. I tell the students that come that uh, they're going to graduate schools and business and they, they're learning all these complicated formulas and all that. If they just learn to communicate better, and both in writing and in person, They increase their value at least 50 percent. I mean, it, it, uh, if you can't communicate, somebody says, you know, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens, you know, basically. And and you have to be able to get get forth your ideas, and uh, that's relatively easy. I did it myself with the Dale Carnegie course. Some people wish I'd taken a shorter course now <laughs> in terms of my talking later on, but it, it it's just hugely important. And you, if you invest in yourself, nobody can take it away from you. I mean, you you. And uh, the second thing, which I'll get a certain criticism for not living it, but, but I do tell the, those students, you know, that if I gave you a car and it'd be the only car you get in the rest of your life, you, you'd take care of it like you can't believe it. Any scratch you'd fix that moment, you'd read the owner's manual, you'd keep a garage and do all these things. And you get exactly one mind and one, and one body in this world. And, and you can't start taking care of it when you're 50. By that time, you'll have rusted out if you haven't done anything. So, You, you, should, you should really make sure that you just remember that you just got one mind and body to get through life with and to do the most with it. Hier ein allgemeiner Ratschlag fürs Leben. Bevor du in Aktien investierst, investier zuerst in dich selbst. Das können Bücher zum Investieren sein oder wie bei Warren Buffett ein Kommunikationskurs von Dale Carnegie. Für Buffett persönlich war genau dieser Kurs wertvoller als jedes seiner Hochschulzertifikate, weil er dadurch im privaten, aber auch im geschäftlichen Leben Dinge erreicht hat, die vorher nicht möglich gewesen sind. Waren. In sich selbst investieren heißt aber nicht unbedingt Geld für etwas ausgeben, das mich weiterbringt. Es kann ganz allgemein so verstanden werden, dass Menschen sich um sich selbst kümmern. Das bedeutet einen gesunden Lebensstil entwickeln, ausreichend schlafen, Sport machen und sich gesund ernähren. Bei der gesunden Ernährung nimmt es Buffett allerdings nicht immer so genau, denn er liebt Cola und Burger. Aber grundsätzlich bringt mir all das Geld, was ich durch das Investieren angehäuft habe, nichts wenn meine Gesundheit nicht mehr mitspielt. You say I've got 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds and and then have a big announcement now we're moving it to 65 35 as some strategists or whatever they call them in Wall Street do. 
I mean, that, that has to be pure nonsense. I mean, it, uh, uh, 60 40 or 65 30, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the, what you ought to do is have your default position is always short term instruments, and whenever you see anything intelligent to do, you should do it, and you shouldn't be trying to, to, to match up with some, uh, some goal like that. I, I found it entertaining. I was just reading yesterday an article, I think it was, the, about the two fellows at Google and and all of the problems they're going to have because they're each going to get a few billion dollars. And I mean, it was, it was, I mean, I wanted to send a sympathy card. I almost went down a Hallmark store because uh, this article went on, they've got this, this terrible problem and that terrible problem and they're going to need lawyers and they're going to need financial lawyers. They don't need anybody. Those guys are smarter than the people that are coming to them. And they do not have a big problem. And, and they're very capable of thinking it through themselves. The people that have the problem are the people who want to sell their services to them and are going to try to convince them that they have a problem. <laughs> but uh, uh, so much of what you see when you talk about asset allocation, or something, it's just merchandising. It's a way to make you think that if you don't know how to determine whether it should be 60-40 or 65-35, that you need these people. And you don't need them at all in investing. I mean, they're, they're most of the professionals that, that uh, tell you you're, you're going to get in great trouble unless you listen to them and, and, and adopt and, and sign up for their services. You know, they're good at selling, but uh, um, it's what my brother-in-law, former brother-in-law that worked at the um, stock yards used to say was that people would bring in cattle or something, and I'd say to them, you know, how do you get the farmer to employ you to sell the Swift or Armor or cut a hay instead of the guy right next to you? I mean, you know, it's a cow is a cow, and Armor's going to buy it the same way, and he gave me this disgusted look, and he said, "Warren, it's not how you sell them; it's how you tell them." Well, that's, there's a lot of that in Wall Street, <laughs> Charlie. Yeah, people have always had this craving to know the future. You know, the king used to hire the magician or the forecaster, and he'd look in sheep guts or something for an answer as to how to handle the next war. And so, there's always been a market for people who reported to know the future based on their expertise. And there's a lot of that still going on. It's just as crazy as when the king was hiring the, the uh, forecaster who looked at the sheep guts. And, and when people have an economic incentive to sell some nostrum, it can be sold over and over and over again. The really interesting figures are when you combine the underperformance of the market, say by the mutual fund industry, which is probably a couple of points per annum. That, that understates it. Now if you take all of the investors in the mutual funds who are constantly whipsawing from one fund to another by a bunch of brokers who want commissions, now you take a subnormal performance and it goes down another three or four percentage points due to the shuffling of the mutual fund investments. So the poor guy in the general public uh, is, is getting a terrible result from, uh, from, from contacting the experts, and these guys are hitting the scout troop and the community chess drive and are locally reputable people. I think it's disgusting. It's much better to make a living by, by being part of a system that delivers value to the people who are, who are buying the product. Nobody uh, refrains from creating gambling casinos or something on my theory. If it'll work to make money, well, we tend to do it in this country. Ja, was Charlie Manger hier sagt, das gilt heute mehr denn je. Es gab schon immer einen Markt für Leute, die aufgrund ihres Fachwissens glauben, die Zukunft vorhersehen zu können. Und früher waren es die Wahrsager der Könige und heute sind es Crash-Propheten und Börsenexperten, die einem verraten, wann man Aktien kaufen oder verkaufen sollte. Denn es ist diese Unsicherheit, die es nun mal beim Aktienmarkt gibt, mit der viele Leute ganz schwer umgehen können. Und Buffets und Mangas klare Aussage ist hier, hinterfrage, was Crash-Propheten und Börsenexperten dir weiß machen wollen und schau dir an, wie diese Leute Geld verdienen. Verdienen sie Geld über ihre herausragenden Renditen am Aktienmarkt oder verdienen sie Geld über hohe Vorgebühren? Einige sogenannte Experten sind auch Edelmetallhändler und haben somit einen klaren Interessenskonflikt. Denn wenn die Leute Angst vor dem nächsten großen Crash haben, dann sichern sie sich eben ab mit Gold und Silber. Es ist also sehr verlockend, genau diesen Crash oder die nächste Hyperinflation anzukündigen. Desire of people to gamble, and they gamble in stocks, incidentally too. Uh, day trading, I would 
say, but people, the, the, the human propensity to gamble is, is huge. Now, when it was legalized only in pretty much in Nevada, you had to go to some distance or break some laws to do any serious gambling. But as the states learned to, uh, you know, what a great source of, of uh, revenue it was, uh, they gradually made it easier and easier and easier for people to gamble. And believe me, the easier it's made, uh, the more people will gamble. I mean, when I was, what, my, my children are here, and 40 years ago, uh, I bought a slot machine and I put it up on our third floor. And I could give my kids any allowance they wanted as long as it was in dimes. I mean, I had it all back by nightfall. Uh, I, th I thought it would be a good lesson for them. And, uh, now, they weren't going to Las Vegas to do it, but believe me, when it was on the third floor, they could find it, you know, and, uh, and my payout ratio was terrible, too, but that's the kind of father I was. Uh, gambling, you know, people are always going to want to do it, and uh, for that reason, I particularly, but I do think that to quite an extent, gambling is a tax on ignorance. I mean, if you want to, if you want to tax the, the ignorant, people who will do things with the odds against them, you know, you just put it in, and guys like me don't have to pay taxes. And I, I, I really don't. I find that, I, I find it kind of socially re revolting when a, when a government makes it easy for people to take their social security checks and start pulling handles uh, or participating in lotteries or whatever it may be. It, it's a pretty cynical act. Ein bekanntes Sprichwort sagt: Hin und her macht Taschen leer. Und für die meisten Anleger ist es klar: Wenn ich mehr handle, dann zahle ich auch mehr Gebühren. Aber das ist nur die halbe Miete, denn wenn ich mehr handle, dann zahle ich auch mehr Steuern. Denn auf alle Gewinne, die realisiert wurden, das heißt alle Aktien, die ich mit Gewinn verkauft habe, darauf bezahle ich eine Abgeltungssteuer von mindestens 25 Prozent. Und häufig ist es so, dass man die Gewinneraktien verkauft, also die Aktien, die gut gelaufen sind und im gleichen Zuge die Verliereraktien behält, einfach aus psychologischen Gründen, weil es mehr weh tut, mit Verlust zu verkaufen. Und diese Gewinneraktien, die man dann verkauft, das sind häufig die größten Fehler, weil diese eben weiterhin gut laufen und Top-Renditen erzielen. Peter Lynch sagt zu diesem Phänomen, Selling your winners and holding your losers is like cutting the flowers and watering the weeds. Wer also seine Gewinneraktien verkauft und seine Verliereraktien behält, der zerstört seine Blumen und gießt sein Unkraut. The question we get most frequently from people about you coming on is, what should they be buying right now? So if I say buy, you say I, I, I say ho basically hold I mean the, the idea that the European news or uh, slow down in this or that or anything like that that would not cause you if you owned a, a good farm and had it run by a good tenant you wouldn't you wouldn't sell it because somebody said here's a news item you know this is happening in Greece or something of the sort if you owned an apartment house and you got to raise your rents a little it was well located and you had a good manager you wouldn't dream of selling it uh, if you had a good business personally, um, um, the local McDonald's franchise, you know, you would you wouldn't be thinking about buying or selling it every day. Now, when you own stocks, you own pieces of businesses, and they're wonderful businesses. You can pick the best businesses in the world, and to buy or sell on current news is is is, is just crazy. You're in a wonderful business. You got people running it for you. You know you're going to do well over five or ten years. And to think news events should cause you to try and dance in and out of something that's a wonderful game is a terrible mistake. So get into a bunch of wonderful businesses and stay with them. Ja, Buffett sagte, wer wirklich überragende Aktien für sich ausgesucht hat, der sollte sich nicht ständig von den Nachrichten verrückt machen lassen. Denn nur weil wir Aktien fünf Tage die Woche verkaufen können, heißt das nicht, dass wir das auch tun sollten. Und das Problem in der Finanzindustrie ist eben, dass Broker genau dadurch Geld verdienen, wenn nämlich Privatanleger mehr kaufen und verkaufen. Und natürlich ist es auch so, dass vor allem Finanznachrichtenseiten und Aktienmagazine von hohen Zuschauer- und Leserzahlen profitieren. Und wenn dort jeden Tag stehen würde, halten Sie Ihre guten Aktien, dann würde es niemand lesen. Und deshalb gibt es hier natürlich auch ein Interesse, immer die sensationellen Top-Rendite-Aktien vorzustellen und vor möglichen Crash zu warnen, weil das eben die Einschaltquoten nach oben treibt. Die Hauptaufgabe eines erfolgreichen Privatanlegers ist es deshalb, die Fakten und die wertvollen Neuigkeiten vom Lärm und der Fiktion zu unterscheiden. In general terms, 
unless you find the, the prices of a great company really offensive, if you, if you feel you've identified it. And by definition, a great company is one that's going to remain great for 30 years. If it's going to be great, a great company for three years, you know, it ain't a great company. I mean, it, uh, uh, I think it's better just to own them. I mean, you know, we could, uh, we could attempt to buy and sell some of the things that, that we own that we think are fine businesses, but they're too hard to find. I mean, we, we found C's Candy in 1972, where we find here and there we get the opportunity to do something, but they're too hard to find. So to, to sit there and hope that you buy them in the, in the throes of some panic, uh, you know, that you'd sort of take the attitude of a, a mortician, you know, waiting for a flu epidemic or something. I mean, it, it, I'm not sure that, that uh, I'm not sure that will be a great technique. I mean, it may be great if you inherit it. You know, Paul Getty inherited the money at the bottom in 32. I mean, I, he didn't inherit it exactly. He talked his mother out of it, but, but <laughs> <We're, we're, laughs> it's, it's true, actually. Close uh, enough. Yeah, close enough, right? But he benefited enormously uh, by, by having access to a lot of cash in, 19, in the early 30s that he didn't have access to in the in the late 20s, and so you can get some accidents like that. Uh, but that's, that's a lot to count on, and you know, if you start with the Dow at X and, you're, and you're, you think it's too high, you know, when it goes to 90% of X, do you buy? Well, if it does and it goes to 50% of X, it gets, uh, uh, you know, you, ne you never get the benefit of those extremes anyway, unless you just come into some accidental sum of money at some time. So I, I, th I think the main thing to do is find wenn du eine Investmentgelegenheit ausfindig gemacht hast, in die es sich wirklich zu investieren lohnt, dann macht es keinen Sinn, auf den großen Crash oder eine größere Korrektur zu warten. Denn die Opportunitätskosten, also die Kosten, nicht investiert zu sein, während die Aktienkurse steigen, sind in der Regel deutlich höher als die möglichen Erträge, die man durch das Kaufen in einer Korrektur einfahren würde. Wer beispielsweise nach 2008 auf eine größere Korrektur von 25% oder mehr gewartet hat, um einzusteigen, der hat beim amerikanischen Markt, dem S&P 500, bis zur Pandemie 2020 über 250% Rendite verpasst. Das heißt, selbst wenn diese Person den Tiefpunkt 2020 perfekt erwischt hätte, dann läge ihre Rendite bei 100% im Vergleich zu knapp 600% für denjenigen, der einfach 2009 schon investiert hat. We would never have cash around just to have cash. I mean, we would never think that we should have a cash position uh, of X percent. And I, frankly, I think these asset allocation things that that uh, the tacticians in Wall Street put out, you know, about 60 percent stocks and 30 percent, we, we think that's total nonsense. Uh, so we want to have all our money working in decent businesses, but sometimes we can't find them or sometimes cash comes in unexpectedly or sometimes we sell something uh, and, and we have more cash around than we would like. And more cash around mean, than we would like means that we have 10 or 15 cents around because uh, we, we want money employed, but we'll never employ it, just employ it. And, 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 and uh, uh, in recent years, we've tended to be cash heavy, but not because we wanted cash per se. In the mid 70s, you know, we were scraping around for every dime we could find to buy things. We don't like we don't like lots of leverage and we never will. We'll, ne we'll never we'll never borrow lots of money at Berkshire. It's just not our style. But you will uh, find us quite unhappy over time if if cash just keeps building up. And I, I think one way or another we'll find ways to use it. Ja, Buffett hinterfragt hier die weit verbreitete Asset Allocation, dass man quasi feste Anteile seines Portfolios in einzelnen Aktien, ETFs oder Anleihen hat, denn damit wird die eigene Handlungsfähigkeit stark begrenzt. Wenn sich eine Gelegenheit zum Investieren bietet und Buffett wirklich zu 100% davon überzeugt ist, dann investiert er auch. Und dann gibt es auch keine Regel, die besagt, es dürfen nur maximal 5% in eine Aktie gesteckt werden. Bei Buffetts Apple Investment im Jahr 2016 steckte Buffett 35 Milliarden Dollar in Apple, was über 20% seines Portfolios damals waren. Buffett sagt hier ganz klar, er investiert nicht einfach nur, weil er Geld rumliegen hat, sondern er investiert, wenn er Top-Gelegenheiten sieht. Und Top-Gelegenheiten sind eben nicht Aktien, die durchschnittliche Renditen versprechen. 
Buffett sucht immer nach einem asymmetrischen rendite risiko -Verhältnis. das heißt viel Upside und wenig Downside. Und diese Gelegenheiten kann man einfach nicht erzwingen, sondern hier ist ganz klar Geduld gefragt. Our position is that there, there is no such thing as, as growth stocks or value stocks uh, the, the way Wall Street generally portrays them as being contrasting asset classes. Growth usually is a positive for value, but only when it, it means that by adding capital now you add more cash availability later on at a rate that's considerably higher than the current rate of, of interest. So. We calculate into any business we buy what we expect to have happen in terms of the cash that's going to come out of it or the cash that's going to go into it. So if you tell me that that you own a business that's, that's going to grow to the sky and isn't that wonderful, I don't know whether it's wonderful or not until I know what what the economics are of of that growth, how much you have to put in today and how much you will reap from putting that in today later on. And the classic case again is the airline business. The airline business has been a growth business ever since well you know that Orville took off but it's the growth has been the worst thing that happened to it it's been great for the american public but the growth has been a curse in the in the airline business because more and more capital has been put into the business at inadequate returns now growth is wonderful it sees candy because it requires relatively little like incremental investment uh, to sell more pounds of candy so it's Growth, and I've discussed this in some of the annual reports, growth is a part of the equation, but anybody that tells you you ought to have your money in growth stocks or value stocks uh, really does not understand investing. You know, the real point is that we're trying to put out capital now to get more capital, or money, we're trying to put out cash now to get more cash back later on. If you do that, the business grows, obviously, and you can call that value or you can call it growth, but, but they're not two different categories. And uh, I just cringe when I when I hear people talk about now it's time to move from growth stocks to value stocks or something like that because it, it just doesn't make any sense. Ja, die Kategorien Value und Growth hält Warren Buffett für überflüssig, denn beide gehören unweigerlich zusammen. Wenn ich eine erfolgreiche Investmententscheidung treffen will, dann ist die Aufteilung in diese Kategorien hinderlich. Denn idealerweise hat man Unternehmen, die beide Kategorien erfüllen, also Unterbewertung auf der einen Seite und Wachstum auf der anderen Seite. Ein Unternehmen, das ein hohes Gewinnwachstum aufweist, ist durch den erwarteten Gewinn der Zukunft heute schon mehr wert, weshalb Value und Growth zu zusammengehören. Wer sich Unternehmen ausschließlich aus der Sicht von verschiedenen Kategorien wie Value oder Growth anschaut, der versteht nicht, dass es einen ganzheitlichen Ansatz beim Investieren braucht. Denn wenn ich nur auf die mögliche Unterbewertung, also den Preis der Aktien schaue, dann blende ich das Potenzial und die Risiken der Zukunft aus. Wenn ich aber nur auf das Potenzial, also das Wachstum in der Zukunft schaue, dann blende ich den aktuellen Preis aus. Also brauche ich beide Blickwinkel und deshalb sind hier Kategorien hinderlich um eine Investmententscheidung zu treffen. Das waren also die elf Mythen rund um das Investieren von Warren Buffett. Was ist deine Meinung dazu? Schreib es gerne unten in die Kommentare. Ansonsten, wenn dir das Video gefallen hat, dann drück den Like-Button und abonniere diesen Kanal für mehr Tipps und Tricks rund um deine Finanzen. Hier oben rechts findest du das Depot, das ich für meine langfristigen Investitionen in Aktien nutze und hier oben links ein Video, das für dich interessant sein könnte. Vielen Dank dir fürs Zuschauen. Bis zum nächsten Video. Ciao.